Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the course BC214 on developing the human spirit. Uh, we're getting into the last few lectures uh, on this course and touching on some important, important uh, things. Um, let's pray and uh, we will get started today. Could uh, somebody please uh, lead us in a prayer this morning? Morning, Kennedy. All right, who will lead us in prayer? Okay, Abinas, would you please? Oh, is Samuel going to lead us? Sure, Pastor. Go ahead, Samuel. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning and we dedicate ourselves. Give us knowledge, understanding and wisdom. We dedicate your servant, Pastor Ashish Raichu, into your hands. Uh, speak through him, Lord. And everything that we learn about developing our spirit may we be able to soak it in, apply it to our lives, and use it for the manifestation of your glory. This and everything else we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Yeah, I see I've asked is not no problem, no problem. Okay, so we have been doing this course on uh, developing the human spirit and we are in the last two sections or so there's one more section that i will cover but we're talking about the faculties of the human spirit which i hope to be able to finish today next week we're going to talk about the functions of the human spirit and then lastly i want to do one lesson on um, imparting spirit to spirit which is against another aspect that we see in uh, in the bible concerning the human spirit so these are the things we're going to there's a ground that we're going to cover so what we have emphasized so far is that uh, we are all spiritual beings and our spirit is eternal meaning from the time it was created it's going to live on forever it never disappears never disintegrates or uh, ceases to exist and now our physical bodies, the, these human bodies, will, dis, will disintegrate. When we die, it will become dust. Now, of course, God has promised to give us resurrection. As believers, we'll have glorified, resurrected bodies, so on. But we're talking about our real person, the human spirit, that will continue to live. So we talked about the fact that when we are born again, we receive the life and the nature of God. Um, and then, you know, uh, the human spirit needs to grow, it needs to be developed. And in very, very uh, many, there are many similarities between the natural human development that we see in a, you know, in a baby and growth, uh, the many similarities to the development of the human spirit. So the Bible does draw that comparison or uh, talk about those similarities. And so what we, you know, so we covered you know, so many things on that. We talked about how to develop, you know, what do you do to develop the human spirit? Just like in the, in the natural, to develop the, for a baby to grow, you know, you feed, you nurture, you exercise, so on. There are things that we can do in the spirit to develop our human spirit. But then that development also means that there are faculties that need to be trained. There are uh, faculties that need to be sharpened and, 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 and used, exercised. Just as in the natural, you know, we have the five senses, or we say five faculties at least, which need to be developed and trained and gets better as you train. So also in the spirit. So we spoke about, so we are talking about each of these faculties. I'm just kind of open. I'm not necessarily covering everything the Bible says on each faculty. There's a lot. And I would encourage you as you're reading scripture to be mindful of, okay, what is, you know, you will find it throughout the Bible as the Bible talks about the various faculties and how 
uh, an individual is interacting with the spiritual realm, it's very good to keep your eyes open and, and, and make note of those things because everything is a learning experience for us. And so um, what I'm doing is I'm just, uh, you know, introducing and in some way awakening us to, hey, th these are the things, this is how God interacts with us through the faculties of our spirit. We should be open, we should be aware, and uh, God will, and you know, as God works or relates to each of us. Uh, it's uh, God doesn't do a carbon copy for all of us, so there are various ways in which God would speak through these faculties, but the thing is for us to be open, to be aware that this is how God speaks and we receive from God and we interact with God or we fellowship with God through uh, these faculties. So let me just go ahead and share the PDF. Um, we are still in chapter six. We're talking about these five spirit senses. We covered the spirit sense of seeing. We were uh, in the spirit sense of hearing. That's where we were kind of... Uh, getting into and uh, what I was emphasizing is this part here where um, in the spiritual realm um, uh, we hear without sound right? we hear you know in the natural sound is required sound is a medium by which words are transferred of course you can transfer it through writing you know you write it on paper or <laughs> through email I mean there are other forms of course of uh, transferring knowledge or words, but I'm talking about communication, verbal communication, uh, we use sound. In the spiritual realm, God communicates, God speaks words to us or messages to us, but uh, it's not always audible in the sense of uh, a sound coming. Now we know that there is sound in the realm of the spirit because, you know, we have John and others who say, you know, they heard in the spiritual realm the sound of no many waters or there was a sound from heaven, etc. But um, uh, when God is speaking to us on a normal day-to-day -day basis, it's we we are, we are not looking for audible uh, words. But we just, you know, God just imparts those words into our spirit. So that transfer of words from God to our spirit happens without sound normally. So we must get, you know, we must tune ourselves. So when, when words just come into your spirit, uh, you just know, okay, this is God speaking. I'm going with this, you know. So I want to encourage us, to, uh, in our last class, I was just, we were, we were getting into that. I just want to encourage us to be aware. The words just come. The knowing comes into your spirit. And it doesn't have to be, some. you know, sometimes it may be specific words, a word or words. Sometimes it's just, you know, like just the knowing of a whole lot of information. Okay, I know this is what I have to do. So God has communicated uh, information to you through your, actually through your spirit sense of hearing. It's come into your spirit. And that's why you know all this. Um, in the natural, it takes time for many words to be transferred. In the spirit, it happens in a moment. I guess one analogy or one comparison could be when you're downloading a file uh, over the over the internet or whatever. You know, so a file basically has a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and it's one file. But when you receive that one file or you download that one file, it's like a lot of knowledge. You know, you could download an entire book, so to speak. And a lot of that information has come to you. Similarly, in the spirit, God just imparts, and you just know in your spirit what to do, you know, and and that's how. But we must be aware. We must be aware. Now, I want to also mention that, uh, you know, when it, what we see in Scripture, many, many things, many things, and I've just put a few bullet points here, but it's amazing when you look into the Bible, what we will find, you know. Uh, sometimes God speaks a single sentence, you know, like Acts 8, 29, the Holy Spirit told Philip, go join this chariot. So what is simple instruction, one instruction, go join this chariot or go get into this chariot, go, you know, step into that. It's very simple as one single sentence, but that's God speaking. And in, in this particular case, in Acts chapter 8, it's very, very significant because as Philip obeyed that one sentence instruction, 
he got into this chariot and in the chariot was you know the ma- a very important man he was the uh, he was in charge of the treasury the finances uh for the queen of ethiopia i mean like you know in modern day terms you would say he's a chief financial officer for somebody very important who was responsible for uh an entire kingdom and so philip just one sentence go join this chariot was an instruction setting philip up to minister to somebody so important who would then take the gospel back into Af- into africa into ethiopia so very very significant sometimes god will speak a few sentences right so that's you find example that in acts 10 the holy spirit tells philip uh, sorry peter peter three men are looking for you go with them doubting nothing or don't ask any questions so it's a few sen- sentences he's telling giving some details three men are looking for you go with them uh don't doubt just go so simple instruction few sentences but something very powerful was about to happen peter was about to bring the gospel to um to the gentiles for the very first time uh so you know god doesn't complicate things god doesn't you know uh what to say uh he doesn't exaggerate sometimes god is sometimes so simple we tend to miss it can you imagine you know how simple these instructions were to philip or to peter very simple instructions but huge huge turning point moments in the life of the church uh, hinged on these small instructions so we you know so uh, what i want to say is god is very you know very simple in the way he communicates he doesn't complicate it he doesn't uh, exaggerate it's just very simple but it's so powerful now there are a lot of other things we see in the bible that you know god can reveal personal details uh, of uh, what's happening in other people's lives he might tell you show you things um uh, it could be god can speak numbers you know um uh, for example in acts 5 um uh, so when he, you know let me just back up here personal details means uh, situations and experiences that have taken place or are taking place in the lives of people uh he does that just to if he shows it to us is using that to minister to somebody to let them know hey i know about you i know what's going on in your life uh, i want to speak into your life uh in the same way god can reveal you know specifics in acts 5 we, uh, we see that peter knew the amount Uh, for which a property was sold and he was not there but he knew you know this is the amount he said you know he told uh, uh, nice did you sell this land for so much amount yeah uh, yeah i mean peter wasn't there but he knew you know whatever that amount was and uh, he knew also that uh, the amount that was actually in the offering which ananias was bringing was not the amount for which the land was sold there was a difference and Ananias had kept part Ananias and Sapphira had kept back part of the land so they were uh, trying to fool the apostles saying that look we sold the land we brought the money here but actually they could have just said look we sold the land 50% we kept in 50% we're giving everything would have been fine but because they were misrepresenting things you know and Peter just knew by the, by the holy spirit uh, lots of other things we see in the bible where some people reveals people's addresses names numbers you know says ananias go to the, there's a man called Saul uh he's in the house of Simon uh, or you know he's in so he's in, in 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 this house here on a street called straight uh, go to that house he's praying or different things uh, go to Joppa there's a man called Simon uh, he's living in, there's a man called Peter he's living in the house of Simon who's a tanner uh, that was his occupation as so a god reveal names numbers addresses occupation so on you know so god can reveal all this so we we just need to learn to pick these things up as we as we hear from god right now i want to say one thing before i uh, pause for questions that when god is speaking just like how when i'm communicating to you right now some of you uh, may have your video on and you may be watching you may be both listening to me 
watching the PDF as well as watching me. So there are three sensory inputs coming to you. There is the audio and there are two visual. One is, you know, what I'm you're looking at me and you're also looking at the PDF. So when God speaks to us, uh, the communication happens in a similar way with multiple channels, right? Um, it's not always just pure audio. The message can come to us with a combination of audio, <laughs> video, and uh, what you feel. That means he's using multiple spiritual faculties uh, in his communication. So we need to synthesize them together and then arrive at the message. That means what you see, what you hear, what you feel, you put it all together and say, okay, this is what God is telling me, right? So, um, Sometimes it could be uh, you're seeing a picture, there's a message coming, and there's a sense of go to it, get up and do it. You feel, you feel stirred. So all of that is part of God, God's message to you, and it's coming to you, right? Um, so the, the next faculty is the faculty of feeling or sensing. Uh, let me just pause here before I uh, go forward into this to see if there are any uh, questions so far. Everybody's with me. Um, any questions? Okay, I'm going to go forward. So there's a question here uh, from Christopher. When we interpret tongues, are we using our human spirit's faculty of hearing? Well, the interpretation, the message or the meaning of of what was spoken in tongues could be could come to us through any of our faculties, right? So when I, for example, suppose I speak in tongues and I feel led by God to interpret it, the interpretation, the meaning of what I've said in tongues can be communicated to my spirit through any of my faculties. So it could come through hearing, it could come through seeing, it could come through feeling, but I need to translate or interpret what God is saying and release the message or it could come through a combination of that yeah so and i need to interpret that yes, there are times when you know uh, uh in the, the whole flow of the interpretation uh, I, I i i i even feel like okay there's a melody coming there's a song that's coming and so i understand the meaning of the words but i feel like seeing singing it out you know so it's it's a combination of words of feelings uh, uh, that's coming out. Sometimes I might see a visual and start describing it. So it's a combination. God is God is communicating the meaning to us through uh, a combination of our faculties. Any other questions? So there's another question here. Uh, when we from Christopher, when we speak in tongues are we using any of our human faculties um, when we are speaking we are uh, our spirit is being exercised in the sense that uh, the holy spirit is releasing words in our spirit and we are by faith speaking out but we are not necessarily using our faculties our spirit faculties in the sense of uh, i'm not interpreting it Right? Like when I'm speaking in tongues, I'm just letting the words come forth and I'm not even processing it in my mind. So the answer there uh, and what I think is just from experience, I'm not giving chapter and verse for this, but just from experience, I think it's just a direct from my spirit speaking by faith. So uh, I, 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 I may not necessarily hear distinct words and even if I do hear distinct words, um, uh, my mind doesn't understand it, so I have no way of interpreting it or picking it up. Uh, I may not feel normally, or I may not see something that I am speaking. So normally, just speaking in tongues is an exercise of the spirit where the words flow out of your spirit and straight out of your vocal organs. However, there, there can be at times, and not always, but at times, accompanying things that are happening through your faculties. That means while you're speaking in tongues, and this doesn't happen all, always, but when you're speaking in tongues, you could be seeing visions, you could be having feelings, uh, you could be 
you know, receiving spiritual understanding or hearing from God. So, so uh, it may or may not be related to what you are saying in tongues. But what I'm what, what I'm saying is, if you're looking purely at the release of words out of your spirit in tongues, there is no exercise of your faculty, a conscious exercise. Right? But uh, what I am saying is, in that process, there could be God could be speaking to you, uh, to us, through our other faculties, uh, through our faculties, telling us some things. Right? So. The answer to your question is, we are not exercising our physical, uh, spiritual faculties in the way that we are talking about and seeing, hearing, feeling. But there is the possibility that God may use those faculties to communicate other things or even the interpretation. Okay. Anita's question, Pastor, why God shows the things what he is doing in others' lives, by God's grace, I had such a dream. Well, there are many, many reasons, as you see in Scripture. He may want us to pray about it. He may want us to uh, bring a word of encouragement to them. He may want them to know that he knows them. So there are many reasons, you know, and we have to be very, we just have to listen to God, what he wants us to do uh, with the information he gives us. Does he want us to just pray about it, keep quiet and just pray about it and not tell anybody? Uh, does he want us to go and speak it to them, to be an encouragement to them? Uh, does he want us to, you know, do something about it? Sometimes he shows you a need in somebody's life so that you can be the answer to that need. You can give to that need. You know, so there could be so many reasons why God is speaking that to us. And we need to listen to him and say, okay, uh, this is what God is telling me to do with the information he's giving me uh, about something in somebody else's life. Okay. Devi's question: Are dreams also part of God making known to us certain things? Yes, yes. So dreams are part of that spirit sense of seeing, right? So we could see dreams, we could see visions. So our spirit is awake, while our physical body is asleep. So the human spirit doesn't go to sleep, right? So your human spirit is awake. And so through your spirit sense of seeing, God is communicating visions which your uh, which is then transferred into our mind. So when we wake up, we are conscious that, look, I've had a dream. God has spoken something to me uh, through the spirit sense of seeing, and sometimes you may receive words, and messages, and so on. So when you're awake, your mind picks it up, you process it, and you use it. So the answer is yes. You know, It's part of that spirit sense of seeing, and many times it could be a combination. You may also hear messages in our dreams, right? Okay, welcome everyone. Let's move to, okay, Prabhaka has a question. Prabhaka's question. Why would God normally speak to us in images, dreams? Why not like we had conversations so we don't miss it? So God is very, very efficient in his working. And in English, we have this little phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I think that's one reason why God uses images, uh, pictures, because in one picture, he can communicate whole information to us and um, that's why uh, we see in the bible also that pictures are a big part of god's communication dreams and visions are the language of the holy spirit he uses dreams and visions visuals pictures because you know a picture can communicate um, a lot of information and so he, he communicates to us and also uh, he wants us to be involved in the process and so he often uses riddles uh, meaning uh, Okay, guys, let's have some fun. Try to figure this out, uh, you know, and he doesn't just speak plainly. He doesn't show you, you know, somebody's face, but he might show you something else, a picture then. And, and so I think he just wants us to be involved in the whole process of interpreting, understanding, and uh, carrying things out. So he may speak to us um, using riddles or using, you know, what we call as images, prophetic images, um, that have to be interpreted, understood. And so it's maybe he just wants uh, us to engage with him in that. Okay. So there's another question here, Avni. Avni's question, Jesus mostly spoke in parables. What exactly was his purpose behind that? Well, there were many reasons. One, is um, parables are, are, are a way by which Jesus would communicate spiritual truth in language that we could understand. So he would use 
things that we are familiar with to tell us about spiritual truth. Secondly, our parables are a way in which to hide truth. So truth is concealed in the story. As the story engages the mind, the goal is for us to go beyond the story to discover truth. So first reason, because the stories are something we all can relate to. It's, these were stories from people's everyday lives. Truth was concealed in the story. So again, there, either you just enjoy the story and go away, or you enjoy the story, but then go beyond the story to say, what is the truth? So uh, what happened in, 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 in people's, uh, in Jesus' audience is many people enjoyed the story. Uh, they didn't pursue the truth, you know, uh, and, and they couldn't really go after the truth. And so that was a problem. But if you ask, you know, uh, these are the two reasons why he used parables uh, to speak to people and that parable would stick in the minds of people, but they need to go beyond the story to discover spiritual truth. All right, now let's go back to the notes. We move forward with our, uh, the faculty, the next faculty of uh, feeling, right? So, so we've covered seeing, hearing, feeling. So the human spirit can also feel. Now we use the word sense, um, but we, when, we, when we use the word sense, you know, we shouldn't mix it up with uh, sensing emotionally or physically. Right, so uh, that's why I put the word sense in brackets because sometimes people get confused. So we are talking about sensing or feeling in the spirit, okay? Uh, and we need to distinguish that from what you feel emotionally or physically. And we will talk about how to differentiate that in the same lesson a little later on, okay? And that is a big challenge for many of us. How do you differentiate what you're feeling as feeling in the spirit versus feeling in your soul, in your emotion or physical, okay? But what we're talking right now is feeling in the spirit. And you find in the Bible, um, and I've just again put a few bullet points, there are many in scripture, where you can feel. For example, these, these you know, this, the, the, some of the fruit of the spirit of peace, joy, um, and, uh, uh, comfort, these are feelings, right? You feel comforted, you feel encouraged, you feel revived, you feel refreshed, you feel peace, you feel joy, you know? And these are, I'm talking about spiritual feelings. These come from the Holy Spirit into your spirit. And then of course, the rest of your being is touched by it. So when we say I'm feeling spiritually refreshed, what is it? It is, it is a feeling. You're feeling energized, you're feeling rejuvenated, you're feeling like oh, all the tiredness is gone and you now have energy uh, to, you know, to move forward. Uh, what has happened? In your spirit, you have been refreshed. And then that comes into the rest of your being. So we can feel peace, we can feel stirred up. That means you feel agitated, you know, like oh, I've got to do something about it. Uh, you can feel compelled. There is something urging you, pushing you, moving you. Uh, you can also feel bound, or sometimes we use the word uh, tightness or disturbed. Uh, I don't feel, or we say uneasy. Uh, that's this feeling of being bound, uh, you know, or restlessness. Uh, I don't feel right about this. You know, it's, it's disturbing me. Uh, you can feel... Uh, uh, bitterness, heat, or anger in, in, in a right sense. Okay, I'm not angry. I'm not. Uh, I'm not angry with a person, but uh, you're, you're you're angered in your spirit about something. Okay, you feel heat, or bitterness. You know, what those are all Bible terms, but it simply means you're angry in the spirit about something, or you can you can feel God upon you. It's almost like a blanket coming over you or uh, some, you know, oil. When, when, when oil is smeared on you, you can feel it, right? Or when oil is poured on you, you can feel it. Now, think about that in a spiritual sense, right? Like a blanket coming on you. So that's why we use the word mantle. In the, in the natural, it's a blanket, but in the spiritual, you feel like a cloth, a mantle coming on you. Uh, 
anointing in the natural it's oil being smeared on you in the spiritual it's like you feel the oil the oil of the holy spirit coming on you okay so these are just some of the things and these are all you find them in scripture so i've given you you know verses that you could look at and we are not turning them into them like these are many uh, experiences uh some felt like john or, or or daniel said i fell like a dead person they fell flat on i mean it's like no more strength you, know, you just fall down dead you know, so that's a feeling in the spirit now of course it will touch your soul and your body but it where is it coming from it's coming from your spirit your inner person so what so we first of all must be aware of the spiritual feelings because god is communicating to you through that you see in the natural when somebody puts their arm around you you can feel but it's also a communication. They are saying, hey, you're my brother. I love you. I'm standing with you, whatever, you know, or I'm comforting you. I empathize with you. You know, it's, it's also communication. So, so also in the spiritual, when you're feeling these things, God is actually communicating something to you when he gives you these feelings in your spirit. And I've tried to interpret some of these when you feel peace, it means all is good, keep going. When you feel stirred up, it means, you know, hey, I want you to do something. Uh, compelled, I want you to do something. Uh, you feel uh, uneasy, hey, st be careful. There's warning, don't step forward or pause. You know, uh, if you're restless, you're moving into action, or it could also mean pause, don't, you know, be careful. When you're angry, okay. God is saying, okay, I know I want you to do what is just and right and execute justice. Uh, you know, a, a weighty feeling, or this is the presence of God. What does God want to do? God's presence is here. How does he want you to move? What does he want you to say? You know, so th these are things. So you recognize. So first thing is to recognize these feelings, right? Recognize these feelings. Uh, then it is to understand what 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 is god saying what does this feeling mean what is god communicating to me through this feeling example i don't know if i listed it here yeah in acts 20 paul says he feels bound in his spirit i feel he says i feel bound in my spirit that means like i feel so tight you know something's tight you know um, you know tied me up so he says, I feel bound in my spirit. Then he says, what is the meaning of it? He says, the Holy Spirit is telling me. So that means this feeling that he has in his spirit, this feeling of tightness, he's interpreting it. He's saying, the Holy Spirit is telling me that there is danger for me in Jerusalem. Chains and afflictions are waiting for me in Jerusalem. So you see, Acts 20, verses 22 to 23, the Apostle Paul is interpreting the feeling. He feels in his spirit, like I saw he's bound, but he knows that feeling is actually a message from the Holy Spirit. And he interpreted it correctly. Holy Spirit is telling me that in Jerusalem, you know, there's chains and afflictions. In other words, the Holy Spirit is warning him, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem now, this is what's going to happen to you. But Paul chose to go. So you see, when the Holy Spirit is warning us, ultimately the decision is in us, with us. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is not going to come and make the decision for us, but he's warning us. He said, look, if you go down this path, this is what is going to happen. Now you decide what you want to do. And in that case, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem and he got into trouble. The, the trouble the Holy Spirit said would happen. You know. Now, of course, we can all ask the question, what would have happened if Paul hadn't gone to Jerusalem? What if he had stayed somewhere? Or he, he had continued his missionary journey, gone into other cities and avoided going to Jerusalem. What would have happened? Well, that's anybody's guess. We don't know how his life would have unfolded uh, if he had uh, heeded that warning. But for whatever reason, Paul chose to go there. And, you know, eventually God turned it around for good in the sense that he ended up in Rome. And in Rome, he influenced the palace guards. He influenced the Roman hierarchy with the gospel. Uh, and, and and that is very, very important because Rome was the then capital of that part of the world. So what happened in Rome 
spread throughout the Roman Empire. So in, in one sense, it, it is very powerful. But um, so the point here is this, recognize the feelings, understand what the God, what God is saying. And then of course, you must decide, what are you gonna do about it? How are you gonna act in response to the feeling and so on, okay? Let me pause here. I'll, uh, I'll try to answer some questions and, and I'm speaking a little fast but I'm trying to cover, complete this chapter today. Uh, let's uh, let's see now, what's some question here? Okay, say you have your hand raised, please go ahead. Yes, Pastor. Uh, the story of Paul's uh, encounter with Agabus, warning him of the trouble he was going to face in Jerusalem. Uh, for some years, I've, I've been, you know, thinking about it. Did, did, Paul disobey the warnings of the Holy Spirit or was just God telling him what was ahead, you know, just to prepare his mind. You know, I, I think about all this and I, I try to see what answers to give. So I just wanted to ask that, where do you stand or what do you think um, God was doing? Was he giving him a warning not to go or was basically a warning to prepare him you know, for what he was going to be facing ahead. Mm. Mm. Because uh, just Good. again, just buttress, um, if we bring it to ourselves, right, maybe a warning comes by the Holy Spirit on a place we're not supposed to go. Ordinarily for me, I think I will not go <laughs> because of mm. the warning of the Spirit. So I, I'm just trying to balance things out to be sure that um, if we're going to talk about this passage to any other person, we make it in context. So maybe I'll just want asking if you could just expand sheets and um, so that we don't fall prey of the enemy. You know, if God is warning us of a particular thing, sometimes I believe he's telling us not to go. And I think sometimes he's preparing our minds. But in this context, could you just explain more, you know, what mm. was God's counsel to to Paul? It was in mm. preparation of what was ahead or what? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, good question. So we do see, like you said, in that particular situation, God spoke to the Apostle Paul three times. One, he spoke to him directly, Acts 20, right, which is the passage you read, the Holy Spirit is telling me chains and afflictions are awaiting me in Jerusalem. Second, the prophet Agabus came all the way uh, from Jerusalem. He meet, meets with Paul and says, Paul, Paul I think was in Caesarea at this time on his way, he says, Paul, and, 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 and in a very dramatic, he takes off his, um, his um, belt or sash, we call it. He wraps himself. He says, Paul, the Holy Spirit is saying, this is what will happen to you. You're the owner of this girdle. This is what will happen to you, Holy Spirit. Thirdly, uh, there were other disciples. So it wasn't Prophet Agabus. It was just regular disciples who also were stirred by the Holy Spirit to give Paul the warning. So the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul three times. One directly, one second through the prophet Agabus, third through ordinary disciples who prophesied, saying, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to get in trouble. But what we notice in all these three cases, the Holy Spirit never said, don't go. So it was a warning but not an instruction not to go. He only warned him saying, look, this is what is, if you, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what is awaiting you. But we don't see the Holy Spirit telling Paul explicitly, thou shalt not go to Jerusalem, right? So that is why uh, we can say that the Holy Spirit warned Paul that this is what's awaiting you. And he left, the decision was, entirely Paul's, right? And uh, Paul decided to go. He decided to go. And one of the reasons we find in the book of Acts why Paul went is he wanted to make a point. He wanted to make a point to the Jews that though he was preaching Jesus, he was not against them. So what Paul actually did was he went to Jerusalem and he went to he went to shave his head and and like you know basically he's trying to prove a point to them that look I am one of you I am you know I, maybe it was his attempt to build a bridge with the Jewish brethren you know uh, 
uh, brother, I mean, the, the, the Jewish people. So he goes to Jerusalem at the time of the feast and he shaves his head and all that. But that, you know, but these people are already so angry because Paul has been preaching so powerfully about Jesus, turning Jews and Gentiles to Christ. They're so angry. There is no way Paul can appease their anger. They, the moment they see Paul is in Jerusalem, they catch him, right? Anyway, so the answer to your question is, this was a warning given three times, but the decision was left to Paul. What do we apply from it? There are times when God warns us, but he lets us make the decision. If God explicitly stated, don't do something, and then we did it, then we are in disobedience. If God just warns us and leaves the decision to us, then, you know, it's like God saying, okay, you make your decision and you go, you walk through the rest of the outcome of that decision. But God was with uh, Paul throughout the journey uh, uh, in, in all that happened. So God didn't forsake Paul just because he went to Jerusalem and got into trouble and, you know, he was under house arrest for a long time. God didn't forsake him. He was with him accompanying him in his decision. But I guess that's the way God works. He honors our decisions. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. That was a good clarification. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So back to our uh, PDF. I'll take a few more minutes and we'll pause here. So what else do we see as far as our spiritual faculties is... There is this whole thing about smelling and tasting. Now, from my own personal experience, and I guess from the experience of many others as well, this is not very common. And, uh, it's kind of unusual. Uh, it's not very common. Maybe some, may, some people may have it more commonly than others, but we must be aware of it and also no recognize it now i've had instances few instances when i've had this smelling type of things but it's not very common but anyway we are aware that there are times when god can make us uh, either taste you know or uh, even smell because there are there is aroma in the spirit uh, fragrance, fragrances in the spirit. We can see it in scripture. And uh, we need to be able to interpret it, right? So usually these, this taste or this aroma comes without any natural cause. So obviously if somebody has sprayed perfume or deodorant or, you know, put in some air freshener, whatever, and you know the room smells nice. Don't say oh, God's presence is here. No, <laughs> it's just somebody sprayed something, right? Okay, so we are ruling that out. But we're saying that when there is no natural cause, and you get a taste in your mouth of something sweet or you know something bitter, whatever, or you smell something, there's, you know there is no natural cause. There cannot be a natural cause, but you can get the aroma then you need to interpret it. So generally what we go with is pleasant tastes and smells is God expressing his pleasure and he's telling us it's like the anointing. You know, the holy anointing oil was a sweet smelling oil, right? So it's a presence of the anointing. And God is moving to do something, whether it's healing or comfort or whatever you know it could be many things so we need to along with the smell just get a sense of what is god telling me or just sometimes you're just saying hello i'm here with you that's all i'm here with you i remember once in one of our uh you know we used to before this lockdown we used to meet uh, for five days of prayer and in our last five days of prayer that was before the lockdown so that must have been 2019, I think. Yeah, 2019. 
Uh, we were having five days of prayer. So this must have been in the month of, uh, can't remember now. Anyway, I must be November, December of 2019. And one of those days, we were all, this was in the Bible college, facility, students, all of us were just worship. It's a whole day of worship and prayer. So we were all together worshiping and the worship leader was, I don't know who it was. Somebody was leading worship. Their eyes were closed. They were, you know, everybody was just in worship. I was standing in one part of the hall and suddenly I could just smell this beautiful smell coming from one side of the hall. So I opened my eyes and nobody was there, you know, so there's no, there's no reason, no natural reason for that smell. And uh, there's just absolutely no reason. Nobody's there. It's one corner of the hall and there's a sweet smell just moving in from that corner into where we were all worshiping. So I, you know, I kind of, I got out of my place. I moved there to make sure that, you know, this is like, I'm not imagining like something I'm smelling. Uh, I could get this smell. Then I uh, called uh, Pastor Selena. She was there. So I told her, you go there and you smell. Can you smell it? You know, I told her, go there. And she also went and she also said, yeah, I can smell this thing. You know, and it was just the presence of God coming in through that sense of smelling, you know, the aroma into the room. Now, I could not tell the worship leader anything because their eyes were closed and they were, you know, all in, everybody was, was in deep worship. Uh, all the students were in worship and everybody was in worship. So, you know, we just, just let it be, you know. And then afterwards I shared, and after in our break time he shared. So that's an, ex an example there, you know, and what was the purpose of it? God, God just saying that, look, I'm here. I'm pleased, that's all. You know, I, I just we just enjoy it, we just receive it and welcome his presence, you know. Sometimes he may move you to do something like healing or deliverance or something. Now, unpleasant tastes and smells, on the other hand, can war be a warning to us. You know, suppose you're listening to somebody preaching and teaching, and suddenly there's an unpleasant taste in your mouth. Like, God, what is that? You know, so I know I ate ice cream for breakfast, and I'm just joking. I know I ate something really sweet for breakfast, so it cannot be something unpleasant that I ate. Right? Or, you know, but then it's God alerting you to saying, hey, what you're hearing is wrong. There is, uh, there is uh, something bad in the teaching. And this is biblically, you know, in, in Hebrews 13, uh, Paul refers to false doctrine. And I'll just give you the exact words very quickly. I know we are almost out of time. But uh, in Hebrews 13, uh, let me see here. He, he refers to, this is, yeah, Hebrews 13. Uh, verse 9, he refers to strange doctrines uh, as uh, bad food. Hebrews 13, verse 9. Strange doctrines is compared to bad food, spoiled food. So, you know, if you, if you eat bad food, what, what happens? You have bad taste. It's very unpleasant. It, you know, you get food poisoning. Your stomach is upset, etc. But he calls false doctrine as bad food. So can you imagine, you're listening to wrong doctrine, you're just listening to somebody false prophet or somebody, and then God is alerting you through an unpleasant taste or smell, you know, um, and, and so on. So we should be aware of it. Okay, uh, we have to stop here. We did not finish what I wanted to cover today, but it's all right, we'll continue this next week. Uh, I want to talk about you know, how do we train our spiritual senses to, so that we can get, uh, you know, get sharp in, 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 in recognizing these things. And we're also going to talk about um, how to differentiate between soul and spirit. Okay. So we'll, we'll pick that up next, uh, next week. Uh, everybody is with me. Any, let's me see. Okay. Christopher's question in Pentecostal charismatic churches, people who are being prayed upon, feel the Holy Spirit, and they fall forward or back. When has this happened in your experience? What is your view on these outcomes in prayer? And is this way of feeling the Holy Spirit? You know, uh, I'll give a quick answer to this question about falling under the power. Uh, it is a genuine experience. We, we see it in the Bible that, uh, you know, there are people who, when they encounter the presence of God, 
physically they become weak, so they drop to the ground. So is it a biblical, is it a genuine thing? Yes. But sadly, what has happened over the years uh, in charismatic Pentecostal spiritual circles is that some of this has been ma manufactured. So some of, of this has become programmed into the whole system, right? So that's something we should avoid. You know, so in many, in some, uh, so many, but in churches, you know, whenever the pastor lays hands, whether you feel anything or not, you'd expect it to go down on the ground. There's a catcher behind you and there's a person in front of you to put a cloth on you. So it's become so programmed into our services. Now, that is something we should avoid. And that's why at APC, you know, for the time we started, we said no catchers, no putting cloths. I mean, if you fall to the ground, it's God's responsibility. God will take care of you. And if you hit the ground hard, hey, so be it, you know. So we just stayed away from it because we don't want to program people into something like this, which if it's a programmed thing, then it's pointless, right? It's good for the video camera. It's good for viewership, but it's a meaningless thing. All right, so we stay away from it. But has it happened? Yeah. There have been times when, you know, I don't touch, I don't push, but people fall to the ground. Now, if people fall to the ground, I don't get involved. I just, okay, if, if it's really God, God will do his work. If they are falling because they are programmed to some kind of a response like this, okay, forget it. It's a waste of time. So I don't emphasize on it. We know it's a genuine thing in the Bible. We know God generally does work through that, but then we don't want to make that the center of our attention. If it happens, let it happen. Let God do what he wants to do. Is that okay? That's a quick answer to a very big question. <laughs> okay. All right, let's take a quick break, please. I don't want to use up your break time. I will meet in the other class shortly. God bless, thanks.